So we're picking up with number eight. So this is another case of epistasis where two different uh, genes cause the outcome. So in this case, we have sweet peas and the genes capital C and capital P affect pigment formation. So basically, they have to have at least one capital C and one capital P to have color. If they are little c, little c, big P, anything, or um, uh, big C, anything, little p, little p, they would have no color. So if they have to have at least one capital C and one capital P. So we're crossing a heterozygous plant, so that's going to be big, little, big, little. So heterozygous for both traits, so um, big C, little c, big P, little p. And then the other plant they say is big C, little c, little p, little p. That's what we're crossing with. And they want to know if that one would have color or not. And your answer is no, because notice little p, little p. It has to have a capital of each to have color. So they want to know what fraction of the offspring would you expect to have colored flowers. So this can be a little tricky. Let me show you. First, I'm going to, I'm going to do the product rule on this. We can actually do it either way. Um, but if I do the product rule, I'm going to get basically... Three-fourths would have at least one capital C, because remember, that's what's necessary for color. The other one-fourth would not. And then um, the other thing necessary for colored flowers is capital P. So our P's in this cross are big P, little p, crossed with little p, little p. And that gives me a one-half chance of having a big P, because this would be little p, little p, so no color, and this would have no color. Therefore, in order to have color, the chances would be the three-fourths chance of having a big C times the one-half chance of also having a big P. That would give us the chance of both of those being present, and so there would be a three-eighths chance of having color. And the other five-eighths would not. All right, the next thing, this is blood types. So this is an example of multiple alleles. So just a reminder what that means is that there's more than just two options. There's not just capital letter and little letter. In this case, there's three alleles, IA, which codes for A, IB, which is the code for a protein B, and little i, which is the code for not making protein at all, but we call that O. So we're crossing an AB person, so that's IA, IB, with a type O person, which is little i, little i. We want to know what kind of blood types our offspring can have. So we get one half IA, little i, one half IB, little i, and that means that our offspring, we would have a one-half chance of having blood type A offspring and a one-half chance of having blood type B offspring. All right, moving on. So these are, um, these are, so this is another product rule problem. Um, this one, so we want to know the chances of these two parents giving this specific gene combination. This is a little time consuming, so I'm going to zip through it a little quickly. So we're crossing big A, little a with big A, little a. I'm not going to fill in the Punnett square. The chances of big A, little a from that cross would be one half. It would be this one and this one. Now we're crossing big B, little b with big B, little b. They want the chances of little b, little b, which would just be that one. So that would be one fourth times our C's, we're crossing, this is interesting, big C, big C with little c, little c. Basically, they're all going to be big C, little c. So we're going to use one for that, because that's 100%. That's the only thing we can get. For our D's, we're crossing big D, little d with big D, big D. They want the chances of big D, big D, which would be one out of two. And then for our E's, big E, uh, little e crossed with big E, big E. And our chances of big E, big E from that cross would also be one out of two. So one fourth times one, uh, one half times one fourth times one times one half times one half is one over 32. And notice how much quicker you can solve this than if you were going to try to do it with a Punnett square. All right, number 11 is different. Number 11 is not asking you to do a cross. This is asking you the chances of a particular sperm or egg. So remember, in a sperm or egg, this goes back to understanding meiosis, which I know some people kind of struggled with. The idea is, in meiosis, this is my genotype, but to a sperm or an egg, I'm only going to give either big A or little a. I'm only going to give, uh, well, I can only give little b, but I'm either going to give the little b on the left or the little b on the right. The point is, I'm only going to give one copy of each gene to an offspring. That was the whole idea of flipping the coins in the baby face lab. Flipping the coin was deciding whether we gave big A or little a. That was meiosis. 
So they want to know how many different kinds of sperm or eggs can this make? Well, the easiest way to do it is look at it like this. This, there are two options here, right? It can give big A or little a times, there's only one option here, it can only give little b times, it can give two options here, either big C or little c times one because it can only give big D times two because it can give either big E or little e. So for every one that there's a choice, I'm multiplying by two. I also had told you you could solve this using two to the n, where n is the number of heterozygous pairs. And notice there are one, two, three heterozygous pairs, two to the third. So there are eight different types of sperm or egg that could be made from this cross. Next question, what are the chances of making this particular sperm or egg? In other words, what are the chances that this combination is what's given? Little a, little b, little c, little d, little e. Well, spoiler alert. If you go back to our original parent, our parent is big D, big D. So basically, the chances of this are zero because a big D, big D parent cannot give a little d because they don't have one. So automatically, since that factor is going to be zero, your whole answer is zero. But this other one is possible. So the chance of big A would be one out of two, right, because there's a choice there. The chance of little b is one because it can only give little b. The chance of big C is one half. The chance of big D is one, because it can only give big D. And the chance of giving big E is one half. So it would be a one eighth chance of this specific combination appearing on a sperm or an egg. All right, number 12 is really good practice with working backwards to figure out the parents of a cross. So they're saying that in peas, yellow is dominant and green is recessive. They're giving you a cross, they're telling you what the parents look like, and then they're giving you their offspring, progeny is offspring. So, first we cross a yellow and a green. Well, we know that the yellow one has to have a capital Y, and we know that the green one has to be little y, little y, because green is recessive. Notice how we have green offspring. That tells us our yellow parent must be heterozygous. Let's try the second one. Yellow with yellow. So that means both parents, immediately we know, have to have one big Y. But notice, again, they gave birth to some green offspring. So they have to be heterozygous because that's the only way that these green little y, little y offspring could have appeared. Now let's look at our next one, green with green. Well, this is a no-brainer because green's recessive. They have to be little y, little y times little y, little y. It's the only way they'd be green. And that makes sense that all their offspring came out green too. Now we crossed a yellow with a green, and all the offspring came out yellow. So that would imply our green one is still little y, little y, but that would imply that our yellow one is homozygous, big Y, big Y, and that's why none of the offspring came out with the recessive trait. And our last one, yellow with yellow, and all of the offspring come out yellow. Now actually, there's two options here. It could be big Y, big Y with another big Y, big Y, or, we don't know for sure, it could be big Y, big Y, with a big Y, little y. Because as long as one of the parents is big Y, big Y, we know we wouldn't be able to get green offspring. So either of these are possibilities for the parents on this last one. All right, last but not least, we have a chi-square test. So I'm gonna scroll all the way down here. You're gonna have to do one of these on the test as well. All right, so black fur is dominant to brown fur in mice, and black eyes are dominant to red. So we have a black furred, black-eyed mouse crossed with a black-furred, red-eyed mouse. All right, so our black-furred, we're using uh, B for fur, so our black-furred, black-eyed mouse has to be big B and big E. Let's just put down our first letter that we already know because they show the dominant trait. The other mouse has black fur, but it has red eyes, so it's little E, little E. Now let's figure out our second letter. Look at our offspring. So did they have any offspring with the recessive traits of brown fur? Yes, they did. Brown fur, and we had some offspring. Did they have, so our, our second letter here has to be a little b. And then did they have any offspring with red eyes? Yes, they did. Red eyes. Therefore, our second letter here has to be a little. All right, so now that we've got our, our parents, let's figure out our expected ratio of offspring. So we'll use the product rule because that's the fastest way. 
So first we're going to cross our Bs and we're going to get the chances of black fur. So if I do this cross really quickly, we are going to get that the chances of black fur are 3 fourths black fur and a 1 fourth chance of brown fur. Now we're going to do eyes. We have big E, little e with little e, little e. And we'll notice that we have a one half chance of black eyes and a one half chance of red eyes. So what are our chances of black fur and black eyes? That's going to be three fourths times one half, which is going to be three eighths. What are we going to multiply that by? We're going to multiply that by our total out of 96 offspring. How many would we have expected to have uh, black fur and black eyes, three eighths of that 96, and that is going to be 36. The chances of black fur with red eyes, three fourths chance of black fur, a one half chance of red eyes. So again, three eighths times 96, that's going to be 36 again. Now, brown fur with black eyes, our chance is going to be one fourth times one half, which is one eighth times 96, and that is going to give me 12. And then um, we will end up with a one-eighth of brown fur with red eyes, also one-eighth times 96, and that gives us 12. And notice these numbers add up to 96, so it's a good way to check yourself and make sure you did it right. If your totals do not add up to the same as you're expected, you did something wrong. Now we're going to plug this into the formula, observed minus expected, so this is going to be 32 minus 36 squared over 36, and we're going to repeat that for all four of them, so I'm just going to copy my answers here really quickly. So I got 0 0.44. All right, the next one I get 0 0.03, then I get 0 0.08, and 1.33. And when I add all of that up, I get 1.88. So this is our chi-square. So this is what we want to compare to our table to see if we accept this data, if this data basically supports that these were what the parents were and that the trait is inherited the way we think it is. So our degrees of freedom is the number of outcomes minus one. There are four outcomes, minus one, three. So three degrees of freedom, and we're always looking at the 0.05 row. So 7.82 is our critical value, three degrees of freedom. Does it pass or fail? Our number is lower than 7.82, so this chi-square passes. And again, if a chi-square fails, it doesn't necessarily mean your math is wrong. It could be that it's too small of a sample size, the trait is sex-linked, the trait is polygenic, you know, uh, your sample was tainted, you know, the trait is just maybe not inherited the way you thought it was, but it would mean that you would need to investigate further and possibly look into that this trait is inherited a different way than what you're predicting. That, that's basically why, you know, why it would fail. It doesn't mean you did anything wrong. All right, so that's all of the homework problems. Hopefully, if you were confused, that sorts it out for you. And we're going to be reviewing all next week for this upcoming test anyway, but please see me if you need extra help.